Well, good evening, everybody. I'm glad that you could join us tonight as the uh, greater church in Mount Shasta and surrounding areas to come and worship the Lord and to really have this time of reflection and reverence, uh, a time of setting aside uh, this season to really reflect on Christ and what he's done. We're grateful you're able to come and gather for Good Friday. Good Friday is typically the gloom before the light. It's the sorrow before the celebration. Now, we live on this side of the cross, and while we do, we live on the, this side of the cross and the resurrection. Tonight, we're going to reflect on some key aspects of Passion Week or Holy Week, the week leading up to Christ's suffering, his obedience, and shattered expectations. And in this time of reflection, we will learn or we will recall the triumph that he has offered us through his suffering. We will also be participating together in the partaking of the Lord's Supper or communion. So as we read the accounts of Christ from the word, we invite you to follow along or to close your eyes and, and hear and listen and whatever you do to reflect on the message that is being shared. Pastor John from Mountain Christian and Pastor Corey are here tonight. He's from the gathering and I'm Pastor Brandon from First Baptist. We're glad to be here with you together to be able to recount these, um, these times from scripture. We hope that you'll find it meaningful to you. The first part of the week we look at is tri the triumphant entry from Luke chapter 19. As he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. Now he came near to the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, If you knew this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not recognize the time when God had visited you. Jesus was finally on his way to Jerusalem, but he was not what the people expected. They hailed him as the one sent to deliver them from their enemies but he had not come to rule and reign as their earthly king and to deliver them from Roman oppression. He was entering the city for something different. What Christ really intended would be fully realized in the cross that he would soon bear. We'll next take a brief look at the Last Supper up in the upper room. And in Luke 22, verse 14, begins and says, When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And so they began to argue among themselves, which of them it could be who was going to do it. And then a dispute also arose among them 
about who should be considered the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them called benefactors. It is not to be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you should become like the youngest, and whoever leads like the one serving. For who is greater, the one at the table or the one serving? Isn't it one, the one at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Coming into Jerusalem, the celebration and exaltation that took place when Jesus came into the triumphal entry, the, the excitement for the coming kingdom was at a fever pitch, especially for those that had given up all that they had to follow Jesus. And here they are at this table. And Jesus' words, as often they did, going somewhat over their heads and definitely past their hearts, began to quarrel about who would be the greatest. They had this expectation that when God's kingdom would come, that great things would happen. And not only that, but that they would be great but it would not be as they expected. Jesus had not come to be served, but to serve. To serve others through suffering. And what Christ fully intended would be fully realized in the cross that he would soon bear. Now we're going to journey to the garden. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he told his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. He went a little further, fell to the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not what I will but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping. He said, Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you stay awake one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you will not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once again, he went away and prayed, saying the same thing. And again, he came and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. They did not know what to say to him. Then he came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The time has come. See, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. While he was still speaking, suddenly a mob came, and one of the twelve named Judas was leading them. He came near Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. But Jesus responded, no more of this. And touching his ear, he healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal? Every day while I was with you in the temple, you never laid a hand on me. 
but this is your hour and the dominion of darkness. The disciples expected to fight. They were looking for a fight. They expected an earthly kingdom to be brought by Jesus. They knew they might die, but they were ready to do it. They were ready to die for a cause they believed in. Christ, however, intended to be the one to fight and die for them because they and we are his cause. What Christ really intended was to fight for our freedom from the real enemy of sin and death. And this would be fully realized in the cross he would soon bear. And then after his arrest comes the most unjust trial in history. And a sentence that was declared by power-hungry men, but was really authorized by the power of the heavens. In John chapter 18, it begins and says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas, to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves, otherwise they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, what charge do you bring against this man? They answered him and said, if this man wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Well, Pilate told, him, told them, Will you take him and judge him according to your law? It's not legal for us to put anyone to death, the Jews declared. And they said this so that Jesus' words might be fulfilled, indicating what kind of death he was going to die. Then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you asking this on your own, or have others told you about me? I'm not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied. Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I'm a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? said Pilate. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no grounds for charging him. You have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a revolutionary. And then continuing the story in the Gospel of Luke, we hear this. But they kept up the pressure, demanding with loud voices that he, Jesus, be crucified. And their voices won out. So Pilate decided to grant their demand and released the one they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for rebellion and murder. But he handed Jesus over to their will. They had charged Jesus with leading a revolution against Rome and against the religious leaders of the day. And then they expected that his death would be advantageous to preserve both the nation and their 
positions of power and prestige. But Christ's real revolution was to offer true salvation for all people, even the rebellious, regardless of their positions, regardless of their power. And this revolution will be realized on the cross that he would soon bear. That finally takes us to his crucifixion. Starting in Mark 15. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They crucified him and divided his clothes, casting lots for them, and decided what each would get. Now it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge written against him was, The King of the Jews. From noon until three afternoon, three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. At about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma shabbatni, that is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? When some of those standing heard this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a stick and offered him a drink. But the rest said, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, and gave up his spirit. Suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they were terrified and said, truly this man was the son of God. Those who crucified Jesus, they expected a brighter day. But as Jesus finally bore the cross, it was no ordinary execution. The earth shook splitting rocks. The veil in the temple tore in half from top to bottom. Tombs were opened and the earth went dark. Darkness invaded and it seemed that light itself had failed. But hope would not be lost and light would not fail. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Through all the shattered expectations, the Roman centurion saw him. He saw the one on the cross and knew that this was the righteous Messiah sent from God. Christ wasn't guilty. He was taking our guilt upon himself so we could be forgiven. Even while we ridiculed him and killed him, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In John's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 31, it says this, These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Corey, would you pray? Close your eyes with me if you would and take a big deep breath. Jesus, we take a moment to ponder the despair that you're followers this night 2,000 years ago must have felt the hopelessness, the emptiness, the confusion, 
the utter terror Every hope, every dream shattered before their eyes. You died. For us. While we were still your enemies, you died for us. Looking down through the centuries and the millennia, you saw each one of us and loved us unto death. Oh, Holy Spirit, allow that to penetrate our hearts tonight. The God of the universe redeemed us, saved us from sin by dying for us. Help us to grasp that. Help our hearts to grasp the immensity of that reality with which we now live in. You went into the very depths of hell and defeated death itself, our greatest enemy. So we have nothing left to fear. As Paul instructed us, help us to no longer cower as fearful slaves, but dearly loved children of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Let us determine to go forward from this night and not take it for granted. Amen. As we continue our service tonight, we're going to be partaking in the Lord's Supper together. This was an instruction given to us, the believers, those who know Christ and love Christ and realize and understand that he died for us. So today, as we do this, I'm going to give some instruction. One being that you need to have some time of reflection and reflect on the part that you might have expectations that need to be shattered by Jesus. And Jesus shatters those expectations. And you might come saying, I, I might be good enough, or I'm almost good enough, or, oh yeah, I'm good enough. You're not. But Jesus is. So as we come to the table today, that is our proclamation, that Jesus is enough for us. And it shows us and symbolizes his, his body given for us, and it symbolizes his blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. Your sin and my sin, not his, ours. So as we do this, make this a time of teaching, teaching for our families, for our children. Maybe you need to take a few minutes together in the in the row there and, and talk and visit and reflect on what this means. Make it a time of reverence as well. This isn't the haphazard time of chitty chatty conversation. This is deep reverent reflection about what the Lord endured for you. And make it a time of remembrance. We should continually remember how great our sins were and are but that his mercy is more. The lights are going to come down a little more, and, and what I'm going to ask you to do is, if you would just, at your leisure, as you've reflected, these, these guys are, and gals are just going to play instrumentally, have that time of reflection and teaching and, and 
and prepare your heart. And then when you're ready and your family's ready, you can stand up and come to the center aisles and make your way down to the table. We have our communion laid out. They're double cupped. There's a cracker on the bottom and juice on the top. And what we'd ask that you take that back with you down the outside uh, walls and go to your seats. And then um, we're going to sing that one song. And just hold on to that. Hold on to the elements together. And then after we're done singing that song, I'll come up and, and we'll lead us in and we'll partake together. And then after we do that, we will close out our service again with reflective and reverent, responsive worship. Okay? Father, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. As we come to your table, we are proclaiming the victory in your death. That you are all satisfying. That you have done all the work. And, and God, when we think we're something, we are not. But you are. And we praise you for that. In Christ's name, amen.